Desk of Data. Hey everybody, welcome to a Sunday smorgasbord Desk of Lady Ada. We've been busy here at my desk. I got a whole bunch of stuff done this weekend. It's Chinese New Year, so happy year of the ox to anyone who celebrates. Um, I'm sure Chinatown here in New York was awesome, but we're staying home, staying safe. Uh, but let's uh, kick it off. We've got a couple things to show off today. I thought uh, let's start with a uh, Stemma Sunday. Do you want to try going to my computer? Okay, so um, this is a really interesting chip. I thought once in a while I'd, I'd show off some like hidden secret, you know, treasures um, from the chip vault. Um, so this is a um, hot swappable I squared C bus buffer with stuck bus recovery. Okay, they got a long name. So this, you know, Folks maybe saw in the store we have the ISO uh, 1540. It's a um, bus isolator for I2C, so you can have totally separated, like isolated electrically uh, bus and power. This is like kind of like a friend to that. It's, it's not isolated, but what it does is, if you've ever had the experience, if you have a board and you're like hot plugging in chips, like semi QT boards, you might notice that um, if you aren't careful, of course, it like can um, jitter the clock and uh, data lines, or even like the, the, the power lines a little bit, and um, it can cause your bus to go into like a weird state where like the number of clocks isn't like eight or nine, and like it gets all weirded out and freaky. Um, if you haven't experienced that, well, congratulations, but it's one of the things I don't like so much about I2C. But what this chip does, which is cool, is um, it separates the clock and data lines on both sides, um, and it like pre-charges them, and also like make sure that like when you plug in the in, it doesn't, or sorry, the out, it doesn't affect the input until it's like, you know, ready. And then it will connect the two when it's like the buses, um, you know, both sides are fully charged um, and there's no activity going on. So this is a cool chip. So I did design a uh, breakout for this. Let's see, where is it? I think it's under level shifters, even though I know technically it's not a level shifter. So let's open this up. Just one second. Okay. So I kind of like copied a little bit of the ISO 1540 design. It's got the separation, but I think this will be really handy. Um, especially when, you know, look at anyone here who's, who's had this experience knows how debilitating it is when like your clock lines uh, get screwed up. Okay, so that's the Stemma Sunday. Um, so now I thought let's uh, spend the rest of the time before the great search on the overhead and let's show some cool stuff here. So first up, okay, Hold on. okay great. Uh, so this is the Cutie Pie 2040. I showed this on the show and I also went by uh, Scott Stream and showed it off. But uh, this is exactly what you think it is. This is a Stemma QT board with the Stemma QT connector, two buttons, power supply, a little micro neopixel right there. And then on the bottom, the RP2040 crystal, a uh, bunch more passives, um, uh, flash chip, probably four megabytes, maybe 16 megabytes, I gotta decide. Um, and all the, um, you know, I know it's castellated, but maybe people can make a cut out of the board. I don't know. Anyways, I think this could be uh, kind of cool. Uh, Bill Binko asked us to make a little jumper for the power pin here, and I did. So hopefully this can be used for USB host as well. Um, so yeah, what's really nice is that it's got all the same pin out and pin names as the STEMI QT, the SAMD21. But of course, it's this awesomely powerful RP2040. So um, I just got back the Rev A PCBs, like kind of mid, like, like Monday or Tuesday, put together, shut it off on Wednesday, and I'm um, doing my final tests on this, but I'm pretty much ready to send out this board, and I think people will dig it, so that's cool. So that's another Stemma Sunday. Thank you, cutie pie. All right, and then uh, next up, I wanna do a little mailbag. Who doesn't love mailbag? I got this in the mail today. So this is the most adorable hot plate ever. It's so cute. So this is by Miniware, and I gotta tell you, like these, this is like the apple of like nerdy engineer shit. Like they're so cool. Like they made um, this awesome. Uh, let's see if there's an. I don't even remember if there's an on-off switch or how this turns on. 
kind of mystified always. Hold on. Maybe you plug it in. You touch it. I don't know, maybe it's maybe the battery has to be charged. But um, they make the, these little smart tweezers um, that I love, and um, they're also well known for their like smart screwdriver and like the TS80 soldering iron. So they love to put little OLEDs and stuff and make like super smart little tools. And this is what I love about this is I want to do like hot plate at home, but like you don't want to have a hot plate that could like burn down your house, right? Like every Amazon review for like a hot plate is like, there's a bunch of five star like, this is a great hot plate. And the other half are like one star burnt down my house. Okay, not good. So uh, this mini hot plate preheater, um, well, hopefully I could be able to actually do some like a hot air, not, uh, not just preheat for like hot air rework, but actually maybe like solder paste and like melt um, a PCB. And uh, so this is it. So the packaging is like Apple-esque too. Okay, so you've got this. I mean, it's like ridiculous, right? Like look how cute this thing is. Uh, so this is the hot plate itself. So there's this like big metal thing and there's like a heating element, I guess, in here. And then um, for the adapter, it's a uh, USB-C and then, like you can't really read the text, but it says 20 volts, three and a half amps. This is like a really chunky power supply. It also comes with like a little Euro adapter. And then of course we'll need a really thick cable. So thankfully, looks like they included it. I just have to figure out how to open this. Ah. Okay, oh yeah, they got these really nice silicone cables. All right, so, I mean, do people want me to plug this in? Phil, anyone saying plug it in? Well, yeah, I mean. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. It's been, it's already been dubbed a cutie pie of hot plates. It, it, well, I mean, so the reason I brought the cutie pie out was because I actually wanted to see, like, is this, would I be able to, like, rework this? I was like, ah, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> Can't take it anymore. All right, so let me, uh. Let me try plugging this in. So hold on, give me a second. I need to unplug this. You might want to swing the camera around uh, a little bit more forward and then tilt it at an angle. So yeah, I'll do that. All right. So I'm gonna yeah, because I want to like show you the little OLED. Yeah. So then and then move it forward a little bit. Oh yeah, look at that. And then this is like the Snyder cut. Yeah. Okay. Is that in focus? It's good enough. It's good enough. Yeah. Okay. All right, so then I'm going to plug this in. Someone suggested you could fry a small egg on it. A very tiny egg. All Get right. Those little quail eggs sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Egg. All right. So heating. Heating. Setting. Oh, they even tell you what, what to do. Okay, so press this button. All right. It's, it's starting to heat up. Yeah, and it tells you it's like 9 volts. Oh, my God. It's like getting really warm. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like hot. All right. Well, I'm going to put this board on just to see what happens. Well, what's going to happen? I don't know. The solder might melt. I want to see how hot it gets, basically. This is so cute. Oh, look. There's like a little Neopixel that changed color. I now guess it's... after it hits a certain temperature. Yeah. So it was green. Now it's blue. Yeah. Now it's like a yeah, bluish, whitish color. This thing is so cool. So I wanted to stop this in the shop. Uh, so I got one to test for myself. So it has to hit 240 degrees for this to be able to, like, uh, you know, melt. How does this actually work? <laughs> I have no idea. Like why, well, how is it it's getting so hot? Like, what's going on? There, there, I mean, the current is going into, like, a basically a resistor. It's, a, it's, you know, it's definitely an electrical heating element. It's basically just like the hot plate on your... Um, uh, 3D printer, right? The thing that keeps it warm when you want to do like, I think ABS plastic requires it. Um, so this has embedded in this top plate, which of course I totally can't touch anymore, is a, um, is like a little uh, resistor going through it that's like 0.01 ohms. Red. red. So yeah, because it's hot. All right, so I'm gonna grab my tweezers real fast. And let's look. It's not quite melting, but I can smell, you know, it's starting to smell like molten solder a little bit. And let's see. No? I'm willing to sacrifice this board a little bit. All right, so it's at 22.30. Oh, yeah, oh, my God, it's, like, actually melting. Look, I could remove a component. 
You did it. Place it. Wow. Okay, so this is cool. So what's great about this? Hot. It's really hot. And uh, so I'm gonna turn this off. And uh, I'll, I'll very carefully, of course, move it's red. But um, what's cool is this is perfect for me to make one stem a QT board at a time. <laughs> this is like, or yeah. like a little quail egg. So uh, much success. I'm actually gonna unplug it because I actually don't know if this is like. Yeah, I don't know if it matters if you let it go through its own cool down process. Or well, not. it's actually heating up. I don't trust it. So I just unplugged it, which is another nice thing. So I'm gonna very, very, very carefully move Will it away. Will a feather fit on that? No, a feather is this big, so it's not good for a feather, but yeah. it's very good for like a stem QT. <laughs> I basically got these just so I can make stem QT boards to, at home. To be fair, that. the Trinket, the Gemma, and the Cutie Pie, those are popular boards. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't want to grab any because it's yeah, very hot. So I, I don't want to show anything. I can see someone getting one of these and running boards with Osh Park, getting yeah. components, and it's like my first reflow. Yeah, yeah, you saw I just lifted yeah. this, this board. So this is perfect for, um, maybe I'll try to get a little angle so you can see the, uh, oh, not. sorry, I'm moving, I'm moving. Yeah, I've said it before, like, if you're just getting started with electronics now, good for you, because everything's available. Everything's available and everything's possible. Yeah, so where, now I know that this works. So, so now you know what I do. So people are like, how do you know when something is good to stock in the Adafruit shop? You just saw the process that I go through. Like I get one and I actually put it through its paces. Okay, like you know, if it's a soldering iron, I'll actually solder a kit together. If it's a hot plate like this or hot air, I'll actually use it to rework a board. So this is good to go. I love it. Oh my God, so cute. Whoa, don't. Oh. Luckily it was just cold enough. It didn't damage itself. So uh, sweet, I'm gonna put this away safely. I'll deal with it later. Nice, okay, so that's approved. All right, so let's move on. So that was mailbag. Cool beans. Good work, Minware. I love their stuff. Minware, they're just like my favorite. Okay, so, um, sorry, clean up time. So next up, uh, I want to talk about a new pull request that just came in to CircuitPython. Might be interesting for people who are uh, CircuitPython users with the RP2040. So, sorry, there's a lot going on here. Okay, so this over here, let me, this is my RP2040 feather. Hold on. No, come on. Okay, this is my RP2040 feather, and this is the Feather M4 RGB LED matrix feather wing. So you plug it in and boom, I'm running the CircuitPython um, example on RP2040, thanks to a pull request by Jeffler and Phil B who worked on this last week. Um, bringing, you know, I saw people using RGB matrices with the Pico in the CSDK, but check it, you know, we now have it in CircuitPython. I had a little bit, a couple little bugs with it that I wanted to um, have them take a look at, but it does pretty much work. Um, and what's cool is you can do like, you know, text and animations and colors and like you don't have to compile anything in C and it works, uh, it even has tiling now. Like I only have one of these matrices. This is a 32 by 64 LED matrix and I only have one here uh, at the desk of Lady Ada, but we have support for tiling them. You can make like a big square or like a big sign if you wanted to. Um, and the RP2040 has tons of RAM, so it's perfect. Uh, for that use case because uh, it can, you know, you the, these displays use a lot of RAM because you have to write the whole display constantly. Um, we're not using PIO for this in case people are asking, hey, are you using PIO? Not yet, but we hope to add it. We're, we're, we want to just get it working first and optimize it later. Okay, so um, while I was doing this, I was like, man, I wonder what the Desk of Lady 8 is going to be, or that, the great search, because we did this uh, IDC cable before, and then I realized, oh, you know what? Terminal blocks. People are always wondering how and what kind of terminal blocks we get. And so, where in the world is that part I need? The great search with DJ Key. All right, the great search is brought to you by DigiKey and Adafruit. This is where Lady Ada uses her powers of engineering 
to show you how to search for things on the GGK site. Thanks, GGK, for making this happen. All right, do you want to go into the overhead again real fast? I'll show what it is I'm going to, I'm going to show. Uh, this is an RGB matrix, um, and these matrices draw a lot of current. You know, they need two to four amps. And so um, they have these big power connectors, these big Molex connectors on the back for power. This is data only. You couldn't pass power over this. No way. Because it's amps, you need these big cables. And on the ends, what I do for um, this little driver board that the RGB matrix data plugs into is I have the power coming in through terminal blocks. Terminal blocks. Screw terminal blocks. Um, so you see here... Uh, hold on. that uh, you use a screwdriver, which of course I didn't want to get in a second. You use a uh, common screwdriver, usually a flathead, but a Phillips also for some. And uh, you can loosen it to remove the cables. And you can see there's like these holes that wire can go into. And we use these a lot. Um, we use these on our motor drivers. So uh, these are uh, terminal blocks. And then you want to measure uh, your terminal block pitch, which is the distance center to center. So these are, I'll get this, these are 3.5 millimeter. Um, sometimes respected inches, sometimes in millimeters. These are 3.5 millimeter. Uh, this one here is more, this is uh, 5.08, also known as uh, 0.2 inch pitch. And um, we use it a lot, whatever we need to pass a lot of current or control a lot of uh, current or have semi permanent connections, like on our cricket board. Uh, you know, we have a solenoid connected and we have a motor connected. These are things that are drawing, uh, you know, an amp or more. Uh, you want to have a solid connection. Yeah, you could use JSTs, but a terminal block, any wire will work, right? And, and why not? That's great. So let's show uh, how to get terminal bo blocks uh, on the DigiKey site. So let's go to the computer. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're at DigiKey. And uh, here's the good news. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm like, ooh, there's like a, a trick to getting uh, the, uh, the terminal blocks, the terminal blocks uh, searched. Um, but, uh, sorry, the, the component, the, find, figuring out the name of the component to search for it. Um, but in this case, terminal blocks is really easy. Uh, you just type in terminal block. Super easy. And let me zoom it in a little bit. Okay, so there's a lot. Um, and the terminal blocks are used like everywhere. There's like punch down type and there's like accessories and there's like, you can tell that there's like, there's power distribution ones. There's ones that are used for like fuse boxes. Um, but we want the basic wire to board kind because it's a wire, screw it in and then attaches it to the board. It's a great, it's a great easy way of making any wire connect to a board. Okay. So uh, next up, let's, as, as usual, apply only active items. Just make it easy. Um, and I want uh, only Rojas compliant ones. And, uh, you know, I only want ones that are in stock right now. Okay, great. So um, the first thing is, well, first off, you can always go down and look at some of, like, the cool, weird, like, this is an angled one. Like, you can see it's, like, not 90 degrees. There's ones with little push buttons instead of screws. So like the screw part is, is optional. They're all terminal blocks, but there's, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, this one is also a little springy type. This one is a screw type, but it's also, you see this angled. I, I'm not a huge fan of the angled types, but like I, I see why people like them, right? So let's first um, count how many uh, we need like positions. Cause actually that, that's the, the most important thing first. For this one, uh, the uh, feather wing for the RGB matrix, we need two pins. Um, so let's search for that. So here's something also when you're searching for positions. So um, terminal blocks, it's not unusual to have them only available in two and three pin sizes because you can slide them together and connect them like they're little, like, like little snappy Lego-y type things. Um, I'm using the word Lego-y uh, completely against how the trademark is supposed to be used, but that's okay. We covered that in the last uh, Ask Engineer. Um, 
So you may, if you need something like a five pin block or like a 21 pin block, you might actually have to be, you might have to get a bunch of three pin blocks and you slide them together. And um, learn from my experience, every brand has a slightly different notch for sliding. You can't mix and match them. So what, you should pick one brand, one maker, and you stick to it because you can't, you can't mix and match them. But uh, believe me, I've, I've learned my lesson with that. I once, I once got a mix of the two pin from one, three pin from the other, and it was a mess. Number of levels. So how many tiers you have? Basically, you know, you have header and you have dual header and triple header. Same deal. How, how deep uh, do you want the connections? In our case, we only want one because we just want a one by two header connector, that uh, terminal block connector. Okay. Next up, the uh, orientation, like the angle, right? How do you want it? Well, um, I want plain, I think, horizontal with board, right? Sticking out this way. Uh, it's parallel to the board, not perpendicular. But again, they got these cool angles. Got to hit them angles. Check those out. So now we go down to these pictures and we're like, okay, yeah, this is what we're looking for, right? This looks, this looks right. There's like tons of different ones. Like this one is kind of a cute angle here. This one, they're photographed a little bit differently. But that's basically what I'm looking for. Next up, through hole or surface mount. Um, oh, sorry. Let's go to the pitch. So you'll see that there's a lot of different pitches. In general, although not 100%, the pitch will determine the max amount of current and the uh, min and max wire size. If you have very small wires, you'll need smaller pitches, but that also means you're carrying less current. So on one hand, the pitch determines like the physical size, but the physical size and the pitch also correlate with the amount of current. So you have to make sure, which so sounds like, okay, like true is true and false is false, sure. If you had a current requirement, um, in my cases, you know, I, my current limit is like two to four amps, which is not that much. But if you have a current limit, um, you might want to search by current. If you're like, look, I know that my robot needs 50 amps. You'd want to search by current for your connector that oh, goes from the, sorry, yes, there's a question. Uh, I know this was uh, covered in part of searching for connectors, but what is the most accurate way to measure pitch on center? Ooh, good question. We actually have a guide on it. Uh, so how about I take a second and give you a tour of my caliper tutorial. Good job, Lady Ada, from a while ago. And I think measuring connector pitch, okay? I got yeah. it, okay? Check out that guy. <laughs> I'll tell you how to do there it. You go. There you go. Um, and so use that technique. Try to get me, but I gotcha. Um, okay, so, right. Current, if current's important to you, use that to determine the pitch. However, in my case, I have size requirements, and so I'm going to do it by the other way around. So whichever is most important to you, if you're, if you're voltage and current bound, use those to search. But for me, I'm not, because it's like, this is five volts, four amps. No, it's not that much. It's like, yeah, it's like barely even going to make a difference. Only like the, the most tiniest pitches would not be able to carry that current. Um, all right, so nothing to watch out for. There's five, and there's 508. Yeah, I know. But in general, the 508s, I found that the 3.5s and the 508s are the most common um, sizes. Those are the ones that we use the most. Um, five is when we have like a, a significant amount of current, usually like four amps. 3.5 is like one amp or two amp is what we use it for. Although again, these can carry a lot more. Okay. Um, so now you'll see, yeah, like if you have a 508 uh, millimeter pitch terminal block, the minimum is eight amps and the minimum voltage is 300 volts. So like you don't, this isn't a big deal. It's only if you are working with something that's again, like 40, 50 amps. All right. And then wire gauges, again, the, the little, the connector, the way that the wire pokes in and you use a screwdriver to connect it, it'll affect your wire gauges. For me, it's not a big deal. I just tell people to add some solder, but if it's important to you, good time to check it out. There are surface mount ones. Um, Let's see if I can load this 360. Oh, sorry. So you can see like the terminals here are surface mount type. That's not what I'm gonna use. Terminal blocks, you can get them surface mount, but uh, they really work best um, as through hole. So I'll get through hole. All right, so great. So now we're actually down to like 73 products. 
That said, they're all going to be very similar, right? There's like, everyone makes, there's like, oh, there's like punchy type, and there's like screw type, this, and there's green, and there's blue. The color doesn't matter. The color is totally your stylistic thing. So given that I have a lot of choices, I'm going to do what I always do, which is sort by price. And then I don't necessarily pick the cheapest thing because there's only 24 in stock. Scary. I don't like that. I'm going to pick the one that has 27,000 in stock, all right? That's like my heuristic. Um, if they have 27,000 in stock now, I'm feeling pretty confident that this is a highly stocked item. I will not have problems getting this in the future. Um, and remember, once you get one model of terminal block, um, if you want to fit them together and make larger ones, you have to stick to one brand. So previous Lady Ada did write a guide about connector pitch, did not think a lot about uh, the realization that the um, little nubbins on the side are different for each uh, brand. So here you can see the 360. So you can see, see that little notch here. And then it matches with this notch here. So you can see, yeah, zoom in. So you see that this notch, you can kind of see this little black triangle. They slit, slide in together to make longer ones. And that's how you make more. And then the only other thing, you know, if you care, uh, do you want Phillips or Flathead? Some people care. I actually personally prefer uh, Flathead for these. So I, this is why I like this particular one from Onshore Tech. Um, but yeah, there's also ones that are Phillips head that people like as well. All right, and that's the great search. Now we found a wonderful, inexpensive terminal block for our RGB matrix feather wing. Where in the world is that part I need? The great search with DJ Key. Okay. All right, that's it. All right. Any other last questions? Um, is the 5.0 millimeter some freedom of unit conversion? Unit conversion. Well, it's 5.08 millimeter pitch. That's the pitch between the contacts. Um, so if you're matching to your PCB, um, you know you'll just have to make sure that you use like a footprint that has the pads, the through hole pads, 5.08 okay. millimeter otherwise known as 0.2 inches apart. Are there screw terminal blocks for PCBs where you can screw by hand, like the ones in audio speakers? Oh, like with thumb screws? I bet there are. Uh, didn't cover it in this great search, but maybe we will in the future. Thumb screws is a, a popular thing. I'm sure there's uh, easy ones. Um, I will say that some people like the, the push connect type, although I, I find them to be tough to use. They're, they're very firm, um, but you, they, are, they do exist. There's ones that don't require special tools. Okay. Okay, cool. And um, that's it for tonight. Um, special thanks to everyone who watched and asked questions. Um, we're here every single week, desk of Lady Ada around Lady Ada o'clock. Um, it's like a necklace, like a very hot jewelry. Yeah, careful. Yeah, it's no longer hot. And uh, thanks for supporting the company. We are um, still a woman-owned manufacturing company in the USA, as weird as that is, we're still doing this. Yeah. So your orders keep it going, so please pick up something they for sure, adafruit.com. Yes, thank you. That uh, supports us and uh, keeps us doing this thing, which we uh, love to do. Yep. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. Have a great week.